Well, good morning. Uh, this is James. Try to go on video for a second here. Uh, this is James. Uh, we're uh, here for our uh, weekly Promise Keepers Bible study Zoom discussion. And um, today we're, we're uh, going through the second half of Ephesians uh, verses 11 through 22. Uh, and I hope everybody's had a good week. Uh, I hope you, our uh, discussion will enlighten you and that uh, you will um, come and come meet with us in person at some point, but uh, understand if you cannot and that uh, you'll get um, what God has for you when you watch this back. All right. Uh, somebody willing to pray us in? Father God, we're so grateful for this time together. Lord, as we open your word, Father, we just pray that the Holy Spirit would open our hearts and open our minds to receive it. God, we're just so grateful for this opportunity to just live out Proverbs 27, 17. Father, we're, we're just sharpening each other as friends. So God, I just pray that you just bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Jonathan. Um, <clears throat> so today we're um, doing a study um, out of a book I got um, that goes through Ephesians 2, uh, 11 through 22. And the title of the study for today is A New humanity so um hostility between human beings is not an invention of the 20th century it has been rampant since the fall of humanity when we chose to be hostile to god alienation between individuals nations races and even hostility between christians is no stranger to us the Bible speaks of human alienation, alienation from God, our creator, and alienation from each other. Nothing is more dehu dehumanizing than this breakdown of human relationships. We are strangers in the world where we, uh, where we should feel at home, aliens instead of citizens so as you think about your your world you're part of this world what examples of hostility between groups of people come to mind well probably one of the the biggest one that's prominent is uh political contentions, racial, uh, religious, uh, several different aspects of contentions. Yeah, it seems like every, anybody who's just a little bit different these days who doesn't think like you, like one person or a small group of people, um, there's there's going to be differences. We do have a lot of alienation going on still. I, I pray, you know, that activities and events and um, occurrences that happen like happened at Asbury a few, few months ago, uh, will continue around the, the world, but uh, uh, it was a uh, that was a shining light of bright hope. I think. I think also there's you know we talk about political you know whether it's Republican versus Democrat and whether you're conservative or liberal, but I think it's also generationally where you're talking about like the baby boomers and Gen Z and millennials. There seems to be a divide instead of unity of each side understanding that 
you know, both are necessary for us to be successful. And they're completely different in how they do everything and how they value things. Right. Absolutely. I don't know if I said this last week or a or week before, but I was recently, um, we were doing a PK booth up in Rochester, New York, in a seminary. And they brought in somebody from Barna Group and they told us, thought we're talking about, you know, the differences, um, you know, the differences in the various generations. And, um, and I was just thinking to myself, um, y- you know, I went through that. <laughs> I-, I went through those kind of thoughts about it's me, myself and I, it's, you know, where do you find your source of truth? Well, you know, I brought, I was at least brought up that, that God was, um, was the source of truth um, and right, rightness, um, righteousness. Um, and it's not about us, but even though I was brought up that way, there was a time when I had to go out and find my independence. And um, that also included separating myself at least a little bit uh, from, from God. And um, that, <clears throat> Just thank God that he brought me right back to him at the right time, right? And I trust that he'll do that again. Um, but I'm not sure if that has anything to do with the study, I guess. But um, um, we're going to read um, Ephesians. We're going to read. Uh, I'd like to read all of Ephesians, if somebody would be willing to do that, or at least 11 through 22. And then we're going to go back and do it in snippets. Uh, would somebody be willing to read Ephesians sure. chapter 2, 11 through 22. Sure thing. Therefore, remember that you once uh, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and, sorry, <laughs> commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and to those who are near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Well, thank, thanks be to God for and, and for you, Brother Carl, reading of his word. Um, so if we could, let's go back in, um, to, to Ephesians 2, 11 through 13 and trace the spiritual biography of the Gentiles through this passage. Um, 11 through 13, I'll, I'll go. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in your world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So what are some of those aspects of spiritual biography of the Gentiles? T. 
Kim, Hello. Rich, are you guys able to join, uh, to join at least in the discussion part today? Or are you working? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Carl. Uh, I think I was just going to say that uh, the Gentiles, obviously, according to this statement, weren't following uh, the ordinances um, of circumcision. Uh, and this was a physical thing that was going on then. So it's, it's what he was talking about in the, in the flesh. He was... Um, which I guess it was a show of faith. Um, and if you weren't circumcised and you didn't have the faith, you hadn't been, um, hadn't acknowledged that um, were, they were separated from the Jew. Um, we call them aliens. Yeah, they were alienated from it. Um, but then with Christ, um, then it goes on, I know, further on to explain it, um, that, that they're also talking about spiritual circumcision here. Um, but in Christ, those that were had been far off were brought near by the blood. So um, it became something that um, that was more associated with the, the feelings of your heart than it was the, uh, the physical act of what you had done. Yeah, yes, I think it was so part they, of that. It was part of that, you know, before Christ, they had no part of the body. Right. Because they weren't God's chosen people. Yeah. They were they, they were, were treated like that. thought I mean, of as some, something completely outside of the body, right? Yeah, because my the NLT says, um, don't forget. So verse eleven says, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. Yes. So I'm chosen, you're not. So I'm good, you're bad. Where's that Where's that scripture? It says uh, we're all, that we were grafted in the vine. That would be Paul. Um, that would be is that John 15 that's where I it think, talks about is it, is it back in the gospels or is that when Paul started um, his ministry 15. Carl Carl will get it for us yeah I am true the, the true vine uh yeah, so anyway, so the Jews did have a lot of contempt for the Gentiles. The Gentiles uh, said that the Jews were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. God, they said, loves only Israel of all the nations that he had made. So what do you think it? What do you think it'd be like uh, to be a Gentile in this pre-Christian condition? You probably, mean? probably similar to what it's going to mean now to be standing on God's word and their biblical values. You're, you're going to be outcast. You're going to be called an extremist. Yeah. I don't think the two commune with each other at all. No. No. Yeah, it made communication hard. Is that what you mean? Is there, you say, Tim? Yeah, you know, it didn't. Wouldn't be in the same room either. Uh, in Romans chapter 11, um, when you get down into verses 22, 23, uh, Brother Tim there, that's where it's talking about, consider the goodness of the severity of God and those who fell severity, but towards you goodness, if the continue in his goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. 
And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Amen. So, so pulling us in to become part of the body, as Jonathan was talking. Yeah. <clears throat> and in verse, uh, in verse 17 is where it actually talks about and you Gentiles who are branches from a wild olive tree have been grafted in. Yes. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children. Yeah, I, I expect maybe in the in the Greek text that grafted in was similar to being adopted, I guess. Uh, adopted into God's um, God's family, God as being God's children. Yeah, and like today, you know, with um, the whole gender identity thing, you know, a uh, lot, if we could, it seems if we could sit down and talk about it, and both sides be able to hear the other, um, that, that we could, we could probably make progress, even though I think sometimes um those who believe differently than I do, anyway, from a um, biblical perspective, um, that that they're right. You know, that they, I don't know, I don't want to get into much of a political debate, but this past week or so we have in Promise Keepers uh, had to deal with a Christian university who did not want to um, support actually they canceled the contract that was already signed for an event uh, in that that they just I guess they I guess somebody went back and reread the our statement of faith and said that just doesn't that doesn't match up with with um, you know our uh, the the biblical standards that we have for our university which means um, to me, um, because I'm really familiar with the Promise Keeper's Statement of Faith, and I'm familiar, not as not as familiar with Ken Harrison's, um, I mean, I'm not familiar with him, but I certainly have heard him speak on numbers of occasions and espouse what the Bible says uh, word for word. Uh, about such things and uh, it seems to be different than uh, what the new generation the younger generation or at least the ones in the younger generation who believe that that uh, gender identity is up to them versus up to God um, lots of reasons for that I think um uh, well, I, I think we talked about we those spent things some, here before. Yeah, we spent some time here in the Justice household, me and the wife both. We sat down and we listened to uh, Ken's interview that he did. Um, Ken is a strong faith Christian. He He's an in-your-face faith Christian. If, if it says it in the Bible, that's the way it should be, and that's the way we should be. Uh, the sad part about it was this college that, you're, that we're talking about right now is, is supposed to be a Christian college. It's not just a college that's saying, you know, your average, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, secular college out there. It's supposed to be a Christian college. Um, and, it, and it goes against, uh, in my opinion, uh, is not teaching the gospel, not teaching the, the truth of the word. Yeah, and that's that's pretty scary when you know your next generation of clergy or 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 things like this are being you know poured into them, uh, or that they are um, not standing up for the truth of of a biblical point of view, and you know it's not everybody in the college. It was certainly the leadership, but I know I saw at least one quote from a student from a seminary student there that or no just a student of the college i guess um that um 
you know, I, I don't agree with this decision and, and it hurt them. And um, so it's not like, you know, I, I just, I just have to believe that it's, you know, 10 or 20% of the, of the population, wherever, wherever that population be, whatever city or whatever, or whatever state maybe, uh, that if you look broadly at all of the people, um, it's, it's a, it's a very small minority that truly believe in, in this, in this non-biblical view. And, um, I don't know. I guess you can ask Bud Light, ask, ask, ask Bud Light about the numbers. Yeah. They, uh, did that transgender thing on their can, <clears throat> but the transge- transgender population wasn't enough to keep their sales up whenever the conservative uh, people stopped buying their beer. You know, they had been number one in beer sales for over 20 years, Ooh. and now they're not. Yep. All because it's the minority that's speaking the loudest, and that's what the news is putting in our face is the minority the five percent yep and it's not just the news it's it's basically all media you cannot all organizations are now having the pride stuff all over you know they redesigned their websites for this month of celebrating pride which it doesn't matter if it's pride in homosexuality pride is a sin whether it's pride in i'm better than anyone else pride is a sin so the fact that we actually take a month to celebrate being proud of living in yeah. sin and contrary to God's word is just really heartbreaking. Yep. And our veterans, let's take one day to remember them. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Well, thank you for that comment, my brother. Yeah. Um, so, so back, so, so back on the study, uh, what did Jesus do for the Gentiles? He hung on a cross and died for them so that they could have a salvation equal to everyone else to bring them into the body of Christ. And I love that he did that with the Samaritans first. Yes. The people that were half Jew and half Gentile. So they were outcast from both groups. Yep. yep. His meeting at the well, that's his first start in bridging the gap. Because had he gone, I think, had he gone just to the Gentiles, then you would have had two groups that said, we're better than you because you're not like either one of us by going to the one that was half and half. It was kind of the bridge to both sides. Yeah. So um, in, in Ephesians two, well, we were doing this in kind of two halves. And I think it's, uh, it's obvious in both that, um, you know, first, first comes a description of life without Christ i.e. dead and excluded, and then follows again in both cases, the great, but God, quote, but God, as in verse four, and but now, as in verse verse seven, I mean, sorry, sorry, verse 13. The main distinction is that in the second half, Paul is stressing the Gentile experience. So, so from that perspective, what did Jesus do for the Gentiles? He, he brought them into the fold. He grafted them in, right? He said, you are now alive and, and part of the body. You're no longer excluded, right? My commentary on verses 11 through 16 says, before Christ's coming, Gentiles and Jews kept apart from one another. Jews considered Gentiles beyond God's saving power and therefore without hope. 
Gentiles resented Jewish claims. Christ revealed the total sinfulness, sinfulness of both Jews and Gentiles, and then he offered his salvation to both. Only Christ breaks down the walls of prejudice, reconciles all believers to God, and unifies us into one body. But in both cases, he unifies us in his desire for us, even uh, even as dying on the cross, is to be unified as, as part of the body, his his church, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what individual Christians or groups of Christians are you are you separated from? either because of uh, theology, culture, denomination, race, or economic differences. Are there any particular persons or groups that you're, are, you're, you feel separated from? So I guess to clarify that, does that mean that I feel like I'm not a part of and I want to be, or I have intentionally <laughs> separated myself? <laughs> <laughs> that was my thoughts yeah. exactly. yes and both yeah. so <laughs> um, no I don't feel like I have been separated from groups that I don't want to be a part of and there are numerous so called Christian um, organizations groups churches that I have separated myself from because what I hear from the pulpit, what I see is not what I read in God's word. So, amen. amen. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I was just thinking back to the 90s and early 2000s uh, when I came back to Christ through Promise Keepers. Um, there just seem to be so many people in the world willing to to uh, accept this, you know, the biblical point of view, the biblical perspective, um, and realize that they had not been uh, living that way. And I was one of them, right? So, but now, you know, we're struggling with the fact that there's a whole group of people, albeit, I believe... Uh, a, a, a squeaky minority, a squeaky wheel minority, a loud minority. I don't mean, I don't mean to denigrate anyone, but because uh, I, I do, I love, I, I, I hope that I forever love every person on this earth um, because their sins are certainly no greater than my own sins. Um, it's just the the fact that they. Uh, they don't repent, right? They don't see the need to 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 turn back to God's view, His Word, for perspective on living and how to how to live. Uh, that that you know, I don't think we have to accept behaviors that are not godly. Um, we don't have to, as and as, as Ken said in his interview, we don't have to. You know, stand by and, and and let that take over the world. We as men, especially called as men, need to stand up for what God's word says and what God has said, right? So, um, so yeah, separating. Um, yeah, I, and if we don't, I think. Um, so. Uh, I lost an, an ambassador to this this week uh, in one of my one of my regions, and um, he just could not get his head around um, the things that were going on, and that you know he is probably caught up in the Pride Month stuff or the the idea of um, the LBGT. Q community um, but we can't you know we just, we just 
quite frankly, we couldn't allow that to continue as a representative of of, of promise keepers. And and I don't think you know, he's he's quite being a, I don't think he's being an ambassador for Christ either. Mm. Uh, so if we second, could, I'm sorry, second Second Peter three ten tells us that he's going to come back like a thief in the night. And I always ask myself questions when I read scriptures. And my my scriptures are ready. Am I ready for him to come? Mm. And and yeah. so if you're putting out all of these doctrines that come feeling good from the heart, um, yeah. it's the worst advice I ever gave my kids: follow your heart, because uh, yeah. your heart's going to lead you down the road of destruction. Yeah. So if he's going to come like a thief in the night. Am I living by the gospel standards or am I living by something that makes me feel good or, or coincides with what others around me? And James, like you brought out, it's a, it is a small population of people that, uh, that have these type feelings, but yet everywhere you turn, it's, it's so in your face, um, which is one reason when we're talking about the gospel um, in my men's purity class, uh, our our beloved pastor Manny, he he doesn't allow people to glorify Satan when they start talking about what the devil did, what the devil did. He said, "Hey, what what about what God did?" And um, take us back to the Word, right? Amen. Yeah, I think it's one of those two. You know, like your uh, verse said, Carl. I think that also re refers back. We can look back at the ten virgins with their oil lamps. Half were ready, half were not. So if we stay ready, guess what, guys? We don't have to get ready. Right. Yeah, because if you have to get ready, it's going to be too late. Um, <laughs> yeah. Kind of like a fire extinguisher. We got to know how to use it before the fire <laughs> breaks out because the worst time to see reading instructions <laughs> is when there's a fire in the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if if uh, somebody let's go if somebody be willing to go back and read uh, Ephesians fourteen through eighteen, how did Jesus bring the Jews and the Gentiles together? For Christ Himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in His own body on the cross, He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So some great things in there, right? Peace, peace, peace. And um and the Holy Spirit. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. It's a simple process. It, yeah. We make it so difficult. <laughs> love God, love your neighbors, and follow Jesus. And that's so hard for us to do. But that's yeah, what he so, did at the cross. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So how do you think Paul can say that Christ abolished the law when Christ himself declared the opposite, that he had come not to abolish it, but to fulfill it? The context of the Sermon on the Mount shows that Jesus was referring to the moral law. He was teaching the difference between Pharisaic righteousness and Christian righteousness and urging that Christian righteousness involves deep and radical obedience to the law. Paul's primary reference here, however, seems to be to the ceremonial law and its rules and regulations, that is, to circumcision, the main physical distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. 
material uh, sacrifices, dietary regulations, rules about ritual cleanness and uncleanness that govern social relationships. What's sounds like it's a difference. It sounds like it's a difference between faith and good works. Yes. Yeah. Although, at least for me, some of those dietary regulations um, <laughs> were needed. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad whenever Peter had his uh, vision and was told that all these animals are now clean. Don't call unclean what I've, you know, made clean. Because otherwise, I wouldn't be enjoying bacon. So, praise God for that. <laughs> Love bacon. Love the bacon guy. Love bacon. Makes everything better. Yeah. What's the significance of the fact that Jesus, uh, and I'll say, quote, preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near? You know, to, 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 to me, it, it doesn't matter where you are, where you are physically, geographically, wherever you are. Um, <laughs> You know, in this gender identity thing, wherever you are, denominationally, theologically, just come to me, right? Follow me, and yeah. and and my desire for <clears throat> you all is to be one body, right? That's what it says, kind of says to me. My, Far uh, away or near. My notes say that this possibly alludes to Isaiah fifty-seven nineteen which says, uh, I'll read 18 um, and through 20. I have seen what they do, but I will heal them anyway. I will lead them. I will comfort them. I will comfort those who mourn. And here's 19. Bringing words of praise to their lips. May they have an abundant peace, both near and far, says the Lord who heals them. And then 20. But those who re still reject me are like the restless sea, which is never still, but continually churns up mud and dirt. And then 21 says, there is no peace for the wicked, says my God. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, he, he, you know, in that he he came to fulfill the prophecy. He came to fulfill the law, the moral law, right? Not, um, and that was to bring peace. And and then you know, you know, he goes and leaves us with the Holy Spirit so that it lasts forever and ever and ever, right? So what does it mean to have access to the Father through one Spirit, as in verse eighteen? of uh, Ephesians 2.18. Well, it's like I said, the simple process. Jesus is the way to the Father. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And so if we want to get to God in heaven, um, Jesus, as you said, came to fulfill the law. Uh, he didn't come to get rid of it. But then everybody says, well, yeah, but he only gave us two commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, <laughs> but if you do those two things, then all those other things fall in place. You, yeah. will be, you will be living the law, which is what he meant by fulfilling it. Is he, lived the law, uh, he lived the life of love of God, which fulfilled the law. I think, what is it, uh, the first four commandments are relating to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Kind of, if you do that, you'll fulfill the first four. And then if yep. you love others, you'll fulfill the next six. Yep. So, taking ten and making it two. That's right. I know yeah. it's pretty early for us to be doing math. But, <laughs> but it's also a lot of more, <laughs> a lot more of us can can count to two than to ten or to, yeah. to remember. Yeah. remember. It's hard to keep up with the two. Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. Yeah. 
I understand. I, I, I struggle. I, I struggle to stay in the spirit every day, every minute, because it truly, <laughs> it truly seems easier if I just do it myself, do it my way, or say what I want to say. But um, that's not mm -hmm. the spirit talking, unless I, uh, unless I ask the spirit to be, to be there, to at least you know think about hey. <laughs> how do I keep the peace here? How do I make joy? How do I let this other person know how much I love them, whether that's my wife and how I love her or my child or children or um, or my neighbor um, <clears throat> who I have another struggle with <laughs> this week. Um, this is a lot, just a minor thing. but um, The status of the Gentiles was dramatically changed. Instead of being refugees, they now have a home. Uh, will somebody read Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 again for us. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Amen. So what's the final outcome of Christ destroying the wall of hostility? You can see what's on the other side of the wall for one thing. A lot of times, a lot of times when walls are built up, we don't even know what's on the other side of it. We just build a wall up and say, I'm not, I don't like those people over there. We don't even know those people over there. So breaking the wall down exposes. And um, that's what it tells us in James 5, 16, brothers confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. That's an exposure. Breaking down the walls between the two exposes the darkness and lets things come to the light. And that's the way I see it. And I think kind of like if we look at the Berlin Wall, when it fell, it gave access to each side, to both sides. So yes. they were no longer divided. They were combined. They were one people instead of two people. You're no longer Jews and Gentiles. You're now one body of Christ. Yes. Yeah, be careful when you break down walls because other people can see your stuff too. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there are also, you know, the Jews, Gentiles weren't allowed in the temple right. to go and worship. Yep. And now uh, there's, you know, you can worship before that's how you could worship God. And the Jewish faith was to go to that temple. Now we can worship him wherever because he dwells within us. Our body is the temple of his spirit. Yeah, our body is the temple, just like his body, the church, is also uh, supposed to be one body and, and representative of him. Tim just brought out a really good point. And i um, not sure that he brought it out the way that it hit me, but... Um, We've been talking about that one way there and what, what Christ did on the cross for us by the blood that it tells us here that, that we were the Gentiles were brought into the fold and stuff like that. Um, so what happened at the crucifixion? That the temple shroud was rent from yeah. top to bottom. Yeah. See, but before then, like you said, the Gentiles weren't allowed to go in the temple. And, and that's what started me really listening there when you was, were talking, Brother Tim. They weren't allowed to go in the temple. But when Christ was crucified, that cloth was rent and God was exposed to everyone. And, we, and he's here and we don't have to go to a temple to worship him. We don't have to go to a temple to talk to him because wherever we are, that's where God is. So that's, uh, I think, the key Amen. way that he made us the one body 
was was separating that and saying you don't need to do this anymore. Yeah, because the Gentiles, I believe, were only allowed in the outer temple. Yes, and that's I think it was in Caesarea that Paul got um, arrested, and the Pharisees and everything claimed that he had allowed a Gentile into the inner part of the temple, and so that was one of the times that he was arrested. Well, uh, in the scripture, as, as we think about the spiritual building that was being constructed, how are the apostles and the prophets the foundation? And why is Jesus considered the chief cornerstone of this building? How are they the found, foundation? This is Peter is the rock, right? <laughs> uh, I think it's one of those where you know you have the cornerstone which is the first thing that's set and everything else is measured off of that <laughs> and as the apostles and the prophets happen they're connected to that cornerstone and go outward so everything remains level everything remains solid when we're talking about the foundation it's yeah, not like they start, They. it's not like you have a cornerstone and then you go to the opposite side and start building there. You build off of the cornerstone itself. Right. And, you know, I, I hear that phrase a lot, um, but I'm always, I don't know, it's something I feel like a necessity to do. But when, when Jesus was asking who he was, Peter said that you're the son of God. And Jesus said, on that rock, I will build my church. He wasn't talking about Peter. He was talking about the fact of what Peter had just said. That he had proclaimed that Jesus was the son of God. And Jesus said, and that's where I will build my church. Yeah. Amen. Yep. That's my understanding of it. <laughs> I know we all, I know there's wonderful songs out there that says, Peter is the rock, Peter is the rock. Um, but that's not what, to me, the scripture says. Jesus said, what you just said is the rock that I'm going to build the church on. Mm -hmm. And he did give Peter the keys to the church. I agree with that part. So it was through the, the belief in him and Jesus, the cornerstone, uh, had come and walked amongst them. He had uh, he'd been in the hearts of the prophets for many years, right? So they were espousing, yeah. um, they were espousing him coming. They were espousing the Holy Spirit being uh, a part of our lives. Uh, and, and then the apostles were to go out and spread that, you know, even further. So I guess that's why I can see their, the foundation. So uh, last question here, how do you respond to being a part of God's new society built together into the holy temple in which God lives? We kind of talked about that already, right? How, but how do you respond to that? Being a part of that. I accept the challenge of waking up at Oh, dark 30 on Saturday mornings to come and enjoy a fellowship with my brothers like this. <laughs> That's one You're moment. here with the rest of us Gentiles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, re the, rest of, the rest of the orphans that have been brought in yep. to the kingdom and are now heirs to all of his fullness and greatness. Amen. 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 So, so um, having just said that, um, it prompts me um, in, in my response is, you know, how do we, you know, let, let's make sure we continue to pray for um, all those guys that, that God has brought to this uh, group in general. There's uh, like 400, over 400 um, that at least were part of the group. I'm not, I hope they're all still part of the group in the new version um but we've cut off we, we seem to be cut off a little bit from um from the chat and from the you know the communication but i just pray that god god just brings us through and 
and and those guys don't you know they're not getting going to get frustrated that you know that, that the holy spirit will fill them and they will come back to what they were what they were getting what i, I think they may still be getting in the prayer group right um and i think that's one of the chat rooms that does work right um that, that guys are still in there and able to ask request prayer and, and pray um at least the last time i checked i don't just don't know how many um were still in there but um you know we've lost you know kind of lost the connection on saturday morning anyway and for me i've lost the connection with a lot of people uh because i can't go look at all the chat rooms right now uh because there's exactly not there right so like Joe and I, I'm, I'm thinking of Jim and um, um, so many, so many other faces that I, that I remember and I just, you know, you guys, you guys know their names. Um, well, the one thing that's difficult right now is um, it, it's hard to even voice the fact that you're frustrated with the way the app's working unless you do it on the main page because I can't go to any other group. I can't contact the PK administrator really directly anymore. As I used to, I could go to PK admin and throw a little note in there and within a couple of minutes, somebody was responding to me. I can't get to those places anymore. And, and it is frustrating. Like right now, it seems like all I'm doing is just scrolling down a Facebook wall, you know? Um, being able to like what's there because if I even try to go to comments that are on there a lot of times it will kick me back out I can't even read the comments that were put on the main page it's not always but it just seems like uh, how it hits sometimes like I can't see the commentaries and I've noticed some of the, some of the posts like Jonathan I see three or four posts from you a day that all I see is Jonathan Smith and it's a small little header line there and if i click on it it takes me to your profile page uh, so i don't know you know huh. i think one of the big things is if pk would give us over the main page an update something sorry guys we can't get this done we're trying to but we hadn't got it done i mean people would like to know because because it's like we we're not seeing any communications that they're trying to fix it i know they are but we're not seeing that communicated to us. I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, that's really, those are really good comments because they're all valid and true. Yeah, I, I remember, you know, when it first came out and I and I wasn't able to, I, I did follow the PK admin and, and I and by doing that, you can do one on one chats. With people but i don't think i ever heard i don't remember hearing anything back or getting a notification that mm -hmm. um that they'd gotten back to me but that you know it, so you know i i'm thankful for you guys that are loyal and continue to come on here on saturday morning and i you know i hope you know I, sort of the first week i i uh kind of threw my hands up and i didn't know what to do uh, hopefully um this week um I think I missed Monday or Tuesday, but um, Monday, or I said Monday and Tuesday, but when I was able to, I just started putting the questions in there. That's one way to put the questions in there. I could do PowerPoint, but if you guys have any suggestions on how that um, might work best, I, 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 and I apologize, I haven't gone into Jonathan, your, your uh, husband's love your wives group, to see how you're doing you can't you can't access it I, I can't access it there's no oh, post really? right now and i go to post and it just shuts down oh i'm sorry about that yeah well, i don't think um, any of the groups are working so so anyway at least i can i can post the questions and i'm going to post the whole study I, i'm not able to post the whole study really uh i can post pictures on the um the Bible study group, <clears throat> and and I guess I feel I feel blessed to be able to continue uh, continue in the Bible study in, in some capacity. But like I said, if you guys have any suggestions on how that might come across better, please let me know. I've been thinking about doing PowerPoint. It's just that's a another another step, and I've been traveling a lot and not. Uh, able to to focus enough to to put it into to, to even try that, but maybe well, the this way you put it, 
I'm sorry, the way you put it in this week was pretty easy because even when I was there, I was telling you when I try to, to look at the contents that's there, it will go to it, but then it'll close out. Like Jonathan said, go to it and close out. I was actually able to keep going to it and letting it close out and was able to read your questions like yep. that. that okay. That's the only way I was able to do it. It kept closing out, but I kept going back, reading the question and it, it would close out. So um, going to the trouble of doing a PowerPoint presentation right now, I would never probably be able to see it uh, because if you had it on there, uh, it wouldn't allow me to go and stay in that area. Okay. Well, good, good feedback. So um, we're at our 10 o'clock hour. Let me just summarize and we'll pray. Um, it would be hard to exaggerate the grandeur of this vision of the new society that God has brought into being. But when we turn from the ideal portrayed in scripture to the concrete realities experienced in the church today, it's very different and a very tragic story. For even in the church, there's often alienation, disunity, and discord. Now Christians erect new barriers in place of the old that Christ has demolished. Now racism, personal animosities gener uh, in, in engineered by pride, prejudice, and jealousy, and the unforgiving spirit. Now a divisive system of caste or class, not a separation. Now, I'm sorry, now a separation of clergy from laity, as if they were separate breeds of human beings. And now the denominationalism that turns churches into sects and contradicts the unity of Christ's church. So how do we apply this? How, just these are food, food for thought questions. I think I put those, these in the, um, in the app. How does this passage encourage you about your relationship with God and with other believers? How do you take for, how do you take for granted being near to God? And what role do you think you might have in breaking down barriers between yourself and others? So I'll leave those for you guys to apply this week and maybe uh, hopefully I'll we'll remember when we get started and it won't be late um, that we have time or you guys even before I get on the guys that get on can discuss you know how have you applied these things this this um, past the past week or in this next 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 week coming so um, with that let us go to the Lord in prayer uh, the, the the prayer for this uh, this study closing this study is to praise God for bringing you so close to himself and to other believers when at one time you were so far away ask him to work in you his grace to live out the truth that the dividing wall of hostility is down between all believers anybody like to use that in um Close us in prayer. Okay, I'll be glad to, if, as long as you guys are still there with us. Let me look, yeah, all right. Um, Heavenly Father, our Abba, our Lord God Almighty, and you do things for us in the past, in the present, and in the future, like no other could ever do. No one can be like you, Lord. And Lord, we just uh, thank you that you have brought us close and that you're about to baptize me with your rain and your Holy Spirit. So if it gets loud, guys, just tell me I'll speak up. Uh, God, thank you for being a part of our lives. Thank you for um, us knowing that it is your church and that you're in control and that we are near you just by asking the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you um, 
bring us your grace so that we can live close to you, so that we can see across that any, any barriers, Lord, in our life that might cause hostility and that we allow you to bring down those barriers, maybe through us, maybe through discussions, conversations, or just love and peace that you bring to every situation anytime we ask. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do in our lives, for being the great I am, and for giving us, through yourself, the way, the truth, and the life. So we ask all this, your favor, your direction in this next week, uh, as we go our, into our own worlds and try to our best to be your church. So we ask in Jesus' net, precious and holy name, amen and amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Thank All right, you, God, God bless you guys. Week. I don't know if you can hear me very well. Well. The rain really it really started baptizing me right then. I I I've held, I've had that feeling once before. I was uh for some reason I was like doing logistics or or, or directing traffic or helping people right outside of an arena at a Promise Keepers conference, and the the theme of the conference was turn the tide, and and I got about five o'clock in the afternoon. I got I got doused so much, so heavily with the with the rain, and I took it as hey, that's the Holy Spirit just yes. infusing me. So I have power. I have um, not power, but I have um, His peace and His Holy Spirit for the rest of the weekend. It was yeah. pretty awesome. But anyway, take, uh, uh, thank you guys for your time. Thanks for coming on. God bless. Go and be the church, man. God bless you guys. Love you, man.